Many of them did advocate for change in their own countries. Why did they stay there and see it through? Well, what you're going to find, um, Hannah, as being a future socialist changer, um, is it's really hard to do that. Um, and you can make you can make strides, but then you get kicked back a couple steps too. And I, mean, I don't have an answer for you, other than European countries actually did achieve a level of socialism much more liberal than in America. And if you look at their like healthcare systems and their pension systems, it is much more um, government, big government, relative to the United States. So from that perspective, I did. Although most of that stuff started happening after World War One, but. So I guess from that perspective, they did achieve something. All right, let's talk about the social gospel movement. Many of you guys um, will see this as a comparison to um, Sacred Awakening. Again, the social gospel movement was about using um, the, your time on earth. This is a Christian movement. Using your time on earth to make the world better. How do you do this thing where there's no cut in the middle? Just, just the middle. middle in between the thing. Whoa. Oh, that's magic. I didn't know what they thought. I didn't know what they thought. What happens? Why was it using well, your time? It's just Yeah, it's good. Remember, a lot, of a, lot of, a lot of Protestant churches believe that Earth is just a place where you prepare yourself for the, your real time in heaven, right? But um, now they're thinking, they're talking about this in Sacred Awakening, and now it's even becoming more substantially based in their religious code. That you change the world for the better while you're on earth. That is your Christian duty to do. What was the what were the ideas of this defined changing the world for the better? Um, helping the poor. Um, giving women rights. I mean the, the suffrage movement was a very, very women's Christian movement. Um, Aboli or sorry, pro prohibition was absolutely seen as it wasn't just let's screw over immigrants, although on some level it might have been. It was alcohol is a problem for women because men are abusing it and staying poor or beating their women and all these things, and alcohol was seen as an evil. So the social gospel movement was part of it, and a lot of people um, really got excited. A lot of these were women. And I, you know what? A lot of you guys see this. A lot of you guys who are Christians see this as something that you do, right? If you want to exercise your religion, this is this is sort of part of who you are, and this is where we start discussing this. Um, all right, the muckrakers. In fact, there's been whole essays just on muckrakers. Uh, muckrakers are journalists. Well, the type of journalists we talked about before that just sort of had scandal and sex stories and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yellow journalists. This is sort of the opposite of yellow journalism. Muckrakers are investigative journalists. These are highly skilled journalists who are exposing corruption. They're, they're going in and they're writing these pieces and exposing these problems. Now here's the thing about them. They don't tell you what to think. Like, um, we're going to talk about these, like, um, they present a story. The, the jungle... The jungle, he tried to get you to be pro-socialist, right? But what did the jungle end up making you want to do? Hey, up. Yeah, be sick and call for, you know, changes in, in meat processing. I don't understand that. Like, I guess they only read the first, like, 50 pages. And they're like, this is so disgusting. I well, you have to also remember, also, yeah. you have to also remember that today in popular literature, you don't have a lot of socialist writing, but then you did. Most, uh, a lot of writers who were influential and smart were, I mean, think about it. half the people on your list that I had you guys read had some level of socialism within its context, right? Yeah. Um, but what was different was, oh my lord, this is gross. <laughs> and also, the story when you guys are reading about Jurgis and his family, you're like, this is the worst thing ever. But for a lot of people, they're like, eh, see this every day. But what I don't see is, a dead feces in my food. <laughs> or a dead body in my food. Like, right? didn't the rats eat the dad or whatever? They're able kids. Starting slow, they just like here. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, oh Stanislavus died crossing the street. No, no, no. no. He died in the rats. He thesis. fell asleep. He, he fell asleep. He fell asleep and was attacked by the rats. Right, I hate that. Um, so I can't remember what happened, so somebody got eaten by rats. Stupid cat. 
Yes, and it's. I've seen that movie where that guy. I think it's Major Shore. He's super, or maybe William, or something. He's super creepy, and he's like, he doesn't have their family or for some reason, and so he makes friends with all these rats, and he goes around attacking people. And eventually, bad things happen, and he. Goes, I have it, but it sounds. Really good. It's really creepy. Bad things happen. Uh, let's talk about a lot of these muckrakers are women. In fact, the first one I want to talk about is a woman named Ida Tarbell. Um, she's actually down here. Um, Ida Tarbell wrote for a magazine called McClure's. McClure's and Collier's magazines were really, really popular progressive journals that had a lot of authors that exposed corruption. In fact, um, Jacob Reese wrote for McClure's. What he would do is he loved that book. Actually, each chapter was in McClure's um, and then became a book. Um, and it was important. Lincoln Steffens wrote a book called The Shame of the Cities. And actually, every one of his chapters was in McClure's and ended up becoming a book. What he did, this is really, really funny, unless you're a corrupt, a corrupt politician. He went to cities, almost every major city, and he started doing an investigation and when he would write his chapter about New York or Philly or Pittsburgh or Chicago, he called people out by name. He wasn't like, Chicago is very corrupt. They have the following problems. We should talk about it. He wasn't saying change. He was just saying, James Mason is the alderman over this area. Here's all the crap that he's done. Here's how much money he's made off of these people. And here are all his connections. Also really bad for the city is Madeline Davis. And we just and he didn't say you gotta go get him. He just had it all out there. And cities started to change because when they saw Lincoln Stephens showed up, they were like, holy crap, we don't want to be in this book. And because of Lincoln Stephens, we start getting calls for what's gonna be called the Australian ballot. He's call, he's calling on he's he's calling out these corrupt people. The Australian ballot is the secret ballot. And that's gonna be one of the big progressive changes. Um, I think because it originated in uh, uh, Indonesia. I guess that, I guess that was the first one. I don't know. <laughs> the Australians, they're, inscr they're an inscrutable folk. Um, Ida Tarbell's dad actually owned an oil company and was pushed out by Standard Oil. She took on Standard Oil. In fact, some of her writing led to people calling for trust busting. And Standard Oil would eventually be sued for antitrust by... Uh, through antitrust legislation. One person um, going out of these companies, they were called muckrakers. You know who gave the name muckrakers, by the way? It's Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt didn't like them. He says they, uh, they uh, raked up muck because they were getting everyone's dirt exposed. Um, it cost a lot of money when they wrote because they had to like verify everything with a whole bunch of sources. They were very, very good journalists. Um, and their investigation led to lots of changes. You got like antitrust legislation coming out of Standard Oil uh, investigation. Australian ballot. Up in Sinclair. <laughs> what is going to be some of the results of the jungle? FDA. The FDA, the Meat Inspection Act. These are, and this is progressive, right? It's government changing these things. Yes. Why did Teddy hate them so much if they were basically wanting change like he did. Well, a couple reasons. Number one, Teddy Roosevelt's progressivism evolved over the years. He didn't just show up really progressive. He got more progressive as the years went on. And a lot of these people were his friends. Roosevelt was incredibly wealthy. And his family were mug -mugs. They were old money. You've heard of old money, right? Roosevelt's were old money. Um, and he thought it wasn't gentlemanly. He was all about being gentlemanly. He did not think it was gentlemanly or nice to write these pieces. The muckrakers didn't completely care what the F Teddy Roosevelt thought was nice or not nice. David Phillips, um, Duncan like him, he wrote a book called Treason of the State. And in his research, he found, and Hannah, I'm sorry for this, of the 90 senators in the Senate, 75 of them were on the payrolls of yes. corporations. That means essentially the Senate was bought and paid for. Literally bought and paid for. Just like this today. It's a little less obvious today um, because of um, campaign finance laws allowing for uh, you know secret super PACs. But yeah, the truth of the state, basically these senators were like, I will vote for your stuff, 
so long as you give me money. They're open for sale. And people couldn't vote them out because who voted in? Senators. Corporations. State legislatures did. And what do you think is going to be one of the calls because of treason of state? Direct election of senators, right? Which ends up being the 17th Amendment. Are there any states with, um, what's it called, uh, term limits? On their what? On, on senators and representatives? No, that's a federal thing, so no, there are no term limits on that. Now, some states have term, well, many states have term limits on the governor's mansion, although some states don't. Arkansas used to change. Arkansas, you used to be able to have be a governor forever, but they only had two year terms. Bill Clinton was elected, I think, five times as governor because he kept getting two-year terms. It was really odd. Um, okay, so let's do a little bit more, and then we'll review a little bit. Um, let's talk about progressive activists. Um, social workers are going to become vital in cities as they're helping people who are um, trying to overcome the problems that were put on them by this cruel and unhelping capitalism. This capitalism that takes away your soul, that eats at the very person of who you are. It's all the truth is there. Yay, capitalism! <laughs> capitalism is the evil. I want to go home and watch this, just because. Do that. Yay, capitalism. That was from, like, um, um, have you seen the first Austin Powers? Yeah. You seen the first Austin Powers when he's like, we made those bloody capitalists uh, pay for their sins. And there he goes, um, Austin, we won. And he went, yay, capitalism. <laughs> uh, Jane Addams, we talked a little bit about Jane Addams before. Um, the whole house creating, and she is part of the settlement house movement, helping poor immigrants, and specifically women, move into or move into a better situation or out of abject poverty. Um, social workers, what type of gender are going to be heavily dominant? In the social work realm, women, women are. So women are becoming active with job opportunities, and this is a this is an educated middle class job too, right? This isn't like seamstress or telephone operator, which is more working class. This is more middle class. I mean, it's not quite as like upper crust as like history or econ teacher, which is pretty much really, really, really socially impressive. Uh, but Jane Addams was a socialist, open about being a socialist. Um, and in the end, I mean, she started Whole House. She was also one of the founding members of the NAACP and um, ended up getting the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931. I put that on my resume. I helped found something. You helped found something? Right. Um, you also know, you know who else you're going to get to this, who was a radical socialist? Florence Hill. Well, she was probably a socialist. Helen Keller. <laughs> my, my respect for her. Helen Keller was a radical socialist. Um, we don't, she hasn't been written that in history because it's not a sweet thing for someone like that to be. So what we remember is her overcoming, obviously, the problems that she was dealt with in life. But she was a radical socialist. And Stan, obviously, will be talking about this in, in the upcoming chapters. Did you know that Madeline is in love with Helen Keller? Oh, look at you. Yeah. That's good. You know what? That's a good person to be in love with. Um, you will be a socialist. Yeah, it's better than Hannah being in love with J.T. Morgan. Um, or, or Miles being in love with Sitting Bull. Um, Florence Kelly. We talked about Florence Kelly a little bit before. Um, she was the Secretary General of the National Consumer League. Who does, who do, who does Consumers Leagues look out for? Consumers. Right. But what does that mean? What are they trying to get off the market? Bad things. Crap that's bad for people. They're trying to get off the market crap that's bad for people. Um, specifically like food with rat feces. Or uh, medicine. The medicines back then were basically useless and or heroin. Like um, There was so much heroin in so many of these things. In fact, one physician said, if you took all the medicine in our country and dumped them into the ocean, the average age of Americans would go up 10 years. Um, many of those, like, um, bottles. But back then, you didn't take pills. You just had, like, a bottle of liquid. And it had bad stuff in it oftentimes. It would just make you feel, or actually, it would make you unfeel. 
right? Um, and uh, often it was addictive. Um, we talked about the Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire um, before.